Uh, if you'd like to come on in, we're going to start our second panel. Take your seats. Uh, good morning. We're going to go ahead and continue our presentations and our going to our second panel. Uh, our second panel this morning is on the bureaucrat kings. Uh, for those of you that are familiar with reality TV, you might think this is the latest show in the fall lineup. There was a show called the Pin Kings at one point. There are the Desert Car Kings, which restore classic cars. Auction Kings, which is takeoff on Pawn Stars. Barter Kings, which are about trading items without currency. But no, this isn't the latest reality show or the latest pop culture. This is reality, uh, reality politics. Coming to a theater, a store, a neighborhood near you, indeed coming into your home every day. Uh, you might not be interested in government, as the saying goes, but government is interested in you. Uh, rather than three branches of government that legislate, execute, and adjudicate, we, the main job of government today is to regulate. And there's really nothing outside of its administrative reach and purview. Uh, indeed, the greatest political revolution in the United States since the establishment of the Constitution has been this shift of power away from lawmaking institutions to this other thing, this regulatory world that affects our daily lives. Uh, what happened? How did we get there? Is there any hope of getting out? Uh, we have a panel today of a lawyer, a political scientist, and historian. That's the start of a good joke, I think, somewhere. <laughs> Walk into a bar. Um, and they will speak in uh, this order. First, we will hear from Paul Moreno. He's the William and Bernice Grucock Professor of Constitutional History and Dean of Social Sciences at Hillsdale College. He received his BA from the State University of New York and his MA and PhD from the University of Maryland. He's held visiting professorships at Princeton University, University of Paris Law School, He's the author of several books, uh, The American State from the Civil War to the New Deal, The Twilight of Constitutionalism, and most recently, The Bureaucrat Kings, The Origins and Underpinnings of America's Bureaucratic State. Uh, he'll be followed by Chris DeMuth, uh, who was a distinguished fellow at Hudson Institution, uh, Institute here in Washington, DC. Uh, he was the president of the American Enterprise Institute uh, for public policy research for uh, uh, some time prior to that. He's a graduate of Harvard College and the University of Chicago Law School. He served in the administrations of Ronald Reagan and Richard Nixon. He taught at the Kennedy School of Government and he directed the Harvard Faculty Project on Regulation. And then last, we hear from John Marini, who is a senior fellow at the Claremont Institute and professor of political science at the University of Nevada, Reno. He's previously taught at the University of Dallas and at Ohio University. He is the author of The Politics of Budget Control. Congress, the Presidency, and the Growth of the Administrative State, and co-editor of The Progressive Revolution in Politics and Political Science, Transforming the American Regime. Uh, Dr. Moreno will start us off. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew, for that uh, introduction. And I'd like to thank all the uh, many friends and benefactors uh, who've, who've made this possible. Uh, of course, Hillsdale College and Dr. Larry Arn, uh, the Institutional Advancement Office and External Affairs at uh, Hillsdale College, and of course for the, uh, uh, the many donors who are here who make uh, Hillsdale uh, possible, and for the panelists for coming out uh, for this discussion of, uh, of my book. Uh, this is the book, uh, The Bureaucrat Kings, and uh, again, if there is anyone here in the audience from the uh, Fertilizer Association, uh, <laughs> and, and you read my book, I, ho I hope you didn't like it because I hope it wasn't something familiar that you want to promote and, and, and spread uh, around the world. 
Uh, as Dr. Spaulding mentioned, I am a historian, but I'm especially grateful to my colleagues in the politics department uh, at Hillsdale, because they're the ones who got me thinking about this uh, topic uh, of the administrative state. Because it's only recently that term, uh, the administrative state, has become, you know, if not exactly uh, popular, uh, at least moved beyond the confines of sort of the academic world. Uh, you hear people talking about it more today, uh, uh, Steve Bannon talking about uh, the Trump administration undertaking the deconstruction uh, of the administrative state. So people are becoming more familiar with what used to be a term that was sort of a technical uh, political science term. It was sort of like uh, the term regimes about 20 years ago, right, where political scientists uh, influencing the, uh, the Bush administration's uh, foreign policy, that sort of term of political science began to enter into the more uh, popular uh, vocabulary. And the administrative state uh, as a, a topic in American constitutional history, my field, uh, was something that I had avoided uh, for a long time. Uh, because people still understand, and people are, at least in some schools anyway, are taught uh, the Constitution, uh, the separation of powers, the structure of the Constitution. And you can read the Constitution and understand it and understand the way that the American uh, political system is supposed to work. Uh, but the administrative state is something that's a lot more technical, uh, complicated, uh, sort of baffling and, and tedious. And when you get into the scholarship of the way the government actually works, as opposed to the way that it's, it's supposed to work, uh, it can be somewhat daunting. Uh, you get into matters in political theory like uh, you know, iron triangles and the non-delegation doctrine and, and subcommittee government. Uh, and it's, you know, again, it can be rather off-putting. Uh, as the late Justice Antonin Scalia uh, put it, who was something of an expert in uh, administrative law, uh, he said, as only he could say, administrative law is not for sissies. Uh, and I put it off for a long time because I'm kind of a sissy, but I, I had to get into it. And so uh, a couple of years ago, I asked my uh, colleague, who was the host of the last uh, panel, uh, R.J. Pistrito, who teaches a course in administrative law at Hillsdale. I said, all right, R.J., if I want to understand this, this topic, uh, what's the sort of the go-to book? Where is the narrative history about how this uh, came to be? Uh, and I discovered that there wasn't any such book, so I set out to try to, to write one myself, sort of a coherent an understandable narrative history of how we got from the Founders' Constitution to, uh, to the administrative state. A couple of people have taken this on. Uh, the great uh, uh, historian of the of 19th century administration, uh, Leonard White, wrote several volumes, uh, but he died before he really got into the 20th century where the administrative state really starts uh, taking hold, but his books are still, uh, still worth reading. Uh, and he also, like most scholars did, I think avoided the important theoretical uh, and the fundamental issue about the hostility between the Founders' Constitution and the administrative state, which I tried to take attention to, uh, pay attention to. A lot of law professors today are writing about this, but for the most part, they are apologists of the administrative state. And they're trying to explain that either there is no incompatibility between the founders and the administrative state, that the real founder of the administrative state was Alexander Hamilton or other founders who had this in, in view all the time, but then history sort of went, uh, went awry. Uh, or they make the argument that there was this administrative state in the 19th century, but nobody noticed it. Uh, and there, it's the, sort of the invisible administrative state. Uh, there's lots of work that's been uh, uh, written about that. Um, a very good book about uh, a piece of this development in the New Deal period uh, uh, by Georgetown law professor named Dan Ernst. Uh, it's called Tocqueville's Nightmare, you know, The Administrative State Comes to America. Uh, but the title is ironic because the argument of the book is Tocqueville's Nightmare didn't wor work out that way, that the administrative state is here and it's fine because the architects of it in the New Deal sort of Americanized it and judicialized it especially, so there's nothing to fear uh, from the administrative state. Uh, and often, uh, even the, the good people, I think the people who understand the problem of the administrative state, have focused, I think, too much on its procedural uh, uh, debilities, the sort of arbitrary nature of the way in which the how, sort of how the administrate, uh, administrative state operates rather than uh, what it does. And these, these issues are important because procedure uh, is important. But just to give you an example of this, this is my favorite uh, illustration by uh, Boston University law professor uh, uh, um, uh, Lawson, who has a textbook in administrative law, uh, where he says, if you consider the typical enforcement activities of a typical federal agency, for example, the Federal Trade Commission, this, you'll get an idea of how the administrative state works. The commission promulgates substantive rules of conduct. The commission then considers whether to authorize investigations into whether the commission's rules have been violated. 
If the commission authorizes an investigation, the investigation is conducted by the commission, which then reports its findings to the commission. If the commission thinks that the commission's findings warrant an enforcement action, the commission issues a complaint. The commission's complaint that a commission rule has been violated is then prosecuted by the commission and adjudicated by the commission. This commission adjudication can either take place before the full commission or before a semi-autonomous commission administrative law judge. If the commission chooses to adjudicate before an administrative law judge rather than before the commission, and the decision is adverse to the commission, the commission can appeal to the commission. <laughs> if the commission ultimately finds a violation, then and only then, the affected private party can appeal to an Article III court, but the agency decision, even before the bona fide Article III tribunal, possesses a very strong presumption of correctness on matters of fact and law. Uh, this is known as Chevron deference, again, in the uh, technical uh, lingo. Anyway, so I wrote this book to try to explain uh, how this came about, how especially were the constitutional safeguards that the founders established to avoid this, how were they evaded? Uh, separation of powers is among the most important of them, but others like federalism uh, also enter into this. And I also uh, tried to discuss what I thought were the intellectual sort of political theory changes in the 19th century that uh, brought this about. Religious changes, uh, changes in American culture, and especially in American education uh, that brought about a drift away from the founders' uh, political theory, uh, and then ultimately the political ways in which this was uh, manifested. Now, fortunate for me, when, when historians try to tell their stories, uh, they look for things in sort of current events and in the news uh, that illustrate the significance of, the, uh, of their topics. Uh, and this usually provides the material for an, an introduction to the book, you know, why this matters, how this affects uh, your everyday life. And there's certainly no shortage of material uh, to show this uh, in how the administrative state is incompatible with constitutional government uh, and the way in which what we see before us today is sort of a realization of what Alexis de Tocqueville described in Democracy in America, uh, the, the specter of uh, administrative despotism. Uh, if I can just read to you this famous uh, description by de Tocqueville of what predicting this sort of 100 years before, uh, before it happened. This is de Tocqueville's nightmare. Uh, where America's passion for uh, equality uh, might produce a new kind of despotism. He prophesied that it would be, quote, more extensive and milder, uh, and it would degrade men without tormenting them. Modern democracy would produce, quote, not tyrants, but rather tutors. I will call it administrative despotism, for lack of a better name. And some people today call this the nanny state. You know, the state has to look out for sort of every aspect of, uh, of your life for you. The government would provide the vulgar material pleasures that democratic men seek. It would be, quote, absolute, detailed, regular, far-sighted, but mild, like a parent who wanted to keep his children from growing up to remove entirely from them the trouble to think and the difficulty of living, right? This is sort of Tocqueville's vision of what the uh, administrative state would like, and it would produce a new type of, uh, of American character. Uh, and in the last couple of years, we had with um, uh, the explosion of new regulation in the Obama administration, uh, first the, the TARP program, the Troubled Asset uh, Relief Program, then the Dodd-Frank Act, and especially Obamacare, uh, it looked like we were nearing the completion of the kind of administrative state uh, that de Tocqueville described, that this was the, uh, the culmination of what uh, Charles Kessler, in his book, uh, I Am the Change about Obama and modern liberalism, describes as a th the fourth wave of uh, administrative government after the progressives and the New Dealers and the Great Society uh, that Obama was completing this project of the construction of the administrative state. And this, you know, the jury is still out about this. People who have hopes for the Trump administration reversing this, I uh, think this is what the, uh, uh, the controversy is all about. Anyway, there's, there's still no shortage of material uh, in, in the daily news illustrating the pathology of the administrative state. Uh, just a couple of days ago, there was a very interesting piece in The Federalist, this is September 13th, about how the Federal Motor Carrier Administration uh, regulations and what they mean for uh, the life of an independent trucker. And if I can just read the beginning of this. It says, I never thought I'd come to a time in my life when Big Brother would be watching me 24-7. But then I became a truck driver. Every minute of every day is monitored by Uncle Sam, who takes care that I can never make a decision for myself based on my circumstances. Right? This is what it's all about. It's about removing the power that individuals have to make decisions that affect their own lives. Because let's face it, I just can't take that kind of responsibility. There's no way I can decide for myself when I'm going to sleep or rest or drive. 
After all, I'm just a stupid truck driver. What would I know about such things, right? Regulators in Washington, D.C. know his business better, uh, better than he does. And this kind of uh, contempt for the ability of ordinary Americans to manage their lives, I think, is what the administrative state uh, is all about. Uh, the economist uh, Jonathan Gruber right, famously said this when we were planning Obamacare, the average American is just too stupid to realize what's in his own interests, so we had to kind of trick them into the way that Obamacare is going to be financed. Unless you own a business, when you hear pundits and politicians drone on about overregulation, the notion probably goes in one ear and out the other. But being a truck driver or any kind of uh, independent businessman is similar to owning your own business. So the next time you hear your senator or favorite radio show, a talk show host, decry government regulation and oversight, let me give you an idea of what over-regulation over looks like on the ground. And literally, he describes the many regulations that uh, truck drivers uh, have to deal with. Um, on the other hand, in uh, recent news, we've had some, some good news uh, come out about this, uh, where the Trump administration's officials have been undoing some of the over-regulation of the last couple of years. Uh, Betsy DeVos, our new uh, Secretary of Education, has revised the ways that colleges are supposed to deal with uh, cases of alleged sexual assault on campus. And if you read what those procedures were, they were a great illustration of just sort of you know, no due process, sort of arbitrary uh, ways of dealing with uh, criminal accusations. Summary procedures that were exactly the kind that the uh, uh, English fought against in the 17th century, in the, uh, the th events leading to the English Civil War and the Glorious Revolution. Wonderful book about this by uh, Philip Hamburger uh, called Is Administrative Law Unlawful? Uh, the, the short answer is yes, it is. It's incompatible with the uh, American uh, Constitution. And he goes into great detail about the historical uh, precedents about this. Um, it's a weighty uh, academic book. I tried to write my book to be sort of more for uh, ordinary readers. Uh, so in a way I could say that before you read Hamburger's book, you should read mine. Uh, my book is sort of Hamburger Helper, if you'll uh, <laughs> I may, may use, uh, use the phrase. Um, and this followed, this DeVos uh, thing about the campus sexual assault, followed a, a reversal of earlier administration action in the Obama administration, the rules about the transgender bathrooms uh, in the schools. You may be familiar uh, with that. And the, the thing that this illustrates the best is that all of this arose from, from again, this gets sort of technical, Title IX of the amendments to the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Uh, and the, one of the sort of landmark pieces of, uh, of great society legislation. Uh, and they had to be added to that because the original Title VI of the Civil Rights Act was dealt with institutions that receive federal aid, uh, prohibited discrimination on race, creed, color, and national origin, but, but not sex. And so sex was added to it uh, in Title IX, right? But all this stuff is about gender, right? And if you go back to the original statute, this happens to be um, section 1681 to 88 of what is Title 20 of the United States Code, you can actually read the original language of Title IX, and it doesn't contain the word gender at all, right? It talks about sex, right? And gender is something that's you know, completely different. Uh, yet the bureaucrats and judges who have uh, supported them, indeed the role of the judiciary in helping in the construction of the administrative state is a really important uh, part of the story. They've been able to transform the language of this statute into something that you know, nobody had in mind in 1972 when it was, uh, it was written. And this is true of affirmative action uh, in general. Uh, my first book was about how uh, you take the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which says no discrimination on the basis of race, right? Uh, but Congress did not define what it meant exactly by discrimination on the basis of race. So that job was taken over by a new bureaucratic agency, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, right? And they decided that no discrimination on the basis of race means discrimination on the basis of race, that you're going to be compelled to take race uh, into account. Uh, indeed, this is the beginning of, of Hillsdale College and some other colleges' uh, rejection of financial aid because of the, the uh, accounting by race strings uh, that are attached to this. And uh, again, people involved in this, uh, law professors sort of deep in the bowels of administrative agencies. Uh, Alfred Blumrosen was the guy who was most responsible for the development of this new definition of discrimination uh, that the courts uh, later accepted. And this is the way that the administrative state works. Congress passes a very vague statute saying that we want a clean environment or uh, no discrimination or reasonable railroad rates or whatever. 
And then it leaves it to the administrators to define, really to make the law, what the substance of what that law is. And then the judges control that when they think they want to. They either confirm or, or strike down these. Usually they, they confirm them. They're usually, they said, uh, very deferential about this. And some of the changes that have been made recently where Congress, for example, saying that no big regulation can kick in uh, if it costs more than $100 billion a year or something unless we approve it. Right? Uh, that's good. It's an improvement over the old system. But it really doesn't take us back to the fundamental point, which is that Congress is not legislating. Congress is not doing its job. Right? Uh, it is deferring. It is uh, uh, delegating to the administrative agencies the power to make this a law. Right? In the same way as with legislative vetoes, where you know, Congress lets the president decide whether we're going to go to war or not, and then is supposed to, through the War Powers Act, uh, ratify that decision. That's not the way the Constitution is supposed to work. So I think the fundamental problem, again, going back to the Founders' Constitution, is restoring the proper uh, uh, behavior of the legislative body, the executive body, uh, and the judicial body. So that's what I try to uh, uh, account for. So Great, thank, thank you. you. Coming between Marino and Marini, I feel my name ought to be Damata or something like that. <coughs> but it's, it's just plain old German Demuth. <coughs> Professor um, uh, Marino's book, which he has summarized, The Bureaucrat Kings, uh, is a, a thorough blow-by-blow -blow account it is both a, a political and a intellectual history, uh, going back to the structure and purposes of the original Constitution, to the first appearances of that uninvited interloper, the administrative bureaucracy in the 19th century, uh, to what he calls four waves of bureaucratic growth in the 20th century. The Progressive Era, 1900 through 1930, the New Deal, 1930 through 45, the Great Society and the New Social Regulation, 1945 through 75, and finally partial deregulation and re-regulation from 75 through 2010. One of the many virtues of his book <clears throat> uh, is the modesty and forthrightness of the conclusions and recommendations that come at the end of this meticulous history. A scholar who writes a book of big ambition and scope, who devotes years of thought and research and lucubrations, uh, when uh, he gets to the end and has to turn to a concluding chapter, often feels that he is entitled uh, to tell the world all of his pet political ideas, which may or may not be related to what uh, came before. Um, uh, so uh, we often find uh, five legislative proposals, three constitutional amendments, uh, a new political party, sweeping proposals coming uh, at the end, very discordant with what came before. <laughs> Marino has none, will have nothing to do with that. He clearly understands the circularity of many such proposals. Uh, a passage of his reminded me of a saying of uh, my old uh, mentor, Edward C. Banfield, who wrote that most policy reforms that come from academics uh, take the form of saying that the solution to drunkenness is greater temperance in the consumption of alcohol. He sees this, and he concludes first that nothing is possible without a reawakening in the public and among our representatives in Congress to the principles of the Constitution. Those principles rightly understood not simply as a regime of a dispersed and contending uh, power, but as a mechanism that tries to use those principles to operationalize limited government and classical liberalism. Second, that reform must begin with the Congress, uh, a realization that it is a body of enumerated powers, 
that the, its member's job is deliberative legislation and that it has to retrieve from the executive branch that which it has delegated. And third, uh, that we need to begin with a deeper understanding of constitutional history, uh, beginning uh, with widespread reading of his book itself. Now, you might think that he's just talking his book, but that uh, uh, statement of his is the very last sentence in the book. You have to read 150 pages uh, to get to it. And what I understand him uh, to be saying is that the important contribution of the scholar is in analysis uh, and depth of uh, description and understanding. Uh, and that the work of actual reform has to be left to practical men and women who have absorbed this uh, scholarship and are uh, in a position to apply it uh, to changing public affairs. My own view of the underpinnings of today's bureaucratic state and the fix we are in is rather different than uh, Professor Marino's. I do not see a steady progression from Woodrow Wilson progressivism <coughs> to FDR New Dealism uh, to the successions of tr twists and turns uh, with a net upward uh, trajectory from LBJ to Obama and Trump. Inde instead, I think that the executive state <coughs> As, had, as it has emerged since about 1970, is fundamentally different from everything that came before. I do not think the Progressive and New Deal eras were irrelevant. They spawned intellectual arguments and institutional arrangements departing from the Constitution's norms. Uh, but since 1970, uh, those changes, intellectual and institutional and constitutional, have been put to radically new and different purposes, which would have been inconceivable to Woodrow Wilson uh, or Louis Brandeis or James Landis, and has and left us with a bureaucratic state which is much more intractable than anything that came before. My explanation for this change is the unprecedented uh, uh, growth uh, over the past 60 years the unprecedented growth and democratization of income, education, and leisure time, and the equally dramatic changes in transportation and communications and information technologies. Altogether, the technologies of human interaction, collaboration, surveillance, and concerted action. Changes in economic welfare and technology our long-term and continuous developments, I acknowledge. Uh, they go back uh, for exactly the century and a half that is the focus of uh, this book's uh, political and intellectual uh, histories. <clears throat> but they arrived, uh, uh, in, uh, they arrived following the enormous growth in post-World War II prosperity uh, of the 1950s and 60s at an entirely new level. For the first time, many, many millions of American citizens had the time and inclination uh, to take an active role in national politics and policy, and they brought uh, to the game many new interests in issues of health, safety, the environment, consumerism, social justice, personal identity and aspiration, which had not been important parts of our politics before. The new transportation and communications technologies from jet travel and broadcast news in the 1960s to cheap long distance communications telephone, telephony in the 1980s uh, to, to today's ubiquitous, endlessly reticulated ecosystem of the internet and social media and smartphones have made it possible for increasingly numerous and discreet causes to achieve collective consciousness and to organize, to press effectively for government intervention on behalf of a uh, endlessly growing list of causes. There are antecedents. As Professor uh, uh, Marino tells us, we had a commission in the 19th century concerned with steamboat safety on the Mississippi River. Teddy Roosevelt was an enthusiastic conservationist. 
We had a federal agency concerned with food and drug safety early into the 20th century. But these were not central. What was central in domestic politics was economic development, industrialization, the sharing of the proceeds of production between owners, managers, and employees. As late as the New Deal, very few average American citizens were keenly interested in environmental quality. The term barely existed. And if they had been, they would have found it impossible to organize themselves effectively against the pressures of, for economic recovery, uh, which were the national politics of the day, in which belching smokestacks were a welcome sign of progress. Beginning in the late 1960s, <clears throat> these material changes I've summarized uh, had uh, four big effects. One is that just as in private markets, falling costs of economic organization <clears throat> and of transactions <clears throat> disrupted, as we say, disestablished old hierarchies. In private markets, it was IBM and AT&T and the big three automakers uh, that fell by the boards. In politics, it was the state and local political machines, the national political parties that had been the arbiters of issues and causes and the disciplining forces of our politics that were disrupted. And in Congress, the seniority system and the system of autocratic uh, committee uh, chairmen uh, were essentially uh, abolished, certainly greatly weakened. The new politics, uh, beginning in the 1970s, was one of atomized rather than hierarchical politics. Uh, it was organized around particular economic and social issues. Second, Congress, as a result, was faced with, an, with unprecedented pressures uh, for intervention, for policy. It was impossible for an institution designed to be as cumbersome and slow-moving as our Congress to cope with all of these uh, pressures and demands for intervention. And they came up with the solution of delegating policy-making, law-making, to specialized administrative agencies, multiplied without limit, EPA, CPSC, OSHA, NHTSA, the Office for Civil Rights, the EEOC, and many, many more. Third, the agencies were in a good position technologically to take the handoff. Uh, they could use new communications and information technologies to organize specialized political coalitions uh, behind uh, the work that they were doing. And they made a discovery that no one had paid any attention to since the Administrative Procedure Act had been passed in 1946, informal rulemaking. In, uh, this was a process by which an agency could simply announce rules, laws, that it intended to implement, essentially canvas for memos, have people just send in their thoughts about what they liked or disliked about the proposal, and then publish the final rule, stroke of the pen, law of the land. Third, and fourth, Congress then adopted a new business model. Rather than the model of the Constitution, lawmaking through deliberation and collective choice, they turned over the real lawmaking, as Professor Marino has given us some examples, to administrative agencies and set themselves up as official lobbyists of this new lawmaking bureaucratic state that they had uh, created. And by financing their careers, their campaigns, uh, re-election, and uh, so forth, by championing narrow economic interests, broad uh, ideolog ideological causes, uh, in the form of cheering on or opposing whatever the executive branch is up to. Now, um, I want to go back to the Progressive and New Deal eras. The Progressive era uh, came up with this idea that it would be effective uh, to combine lawmaking, surveillance, enforcement, and adjudication, all three things that had been dispersed in the Constitution in the hands of neutral expert uh, administrators. Uh, the New Deal uh, 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 forced the courts essentially to abandon most of the constitutional constraints that had uh, governed 
uh, for a century and a half, especially the commerce power, uh, the notion of uh, uh, the commerce power, the idea of enumerated and limited powers, delegation to administrative agencies, and differential non-protection of economic rights. All of those things took place in the 1930s, but the effects of both the Progressive and New Deal changes were much, much uh, less profound at the time and might even have been abandoned or reversed but for the important material developments that came later. Let me give you a few examples. The Progressive Era was actually much more talk than action. What were the great bureaucratic achievements? The Federal Trade Commission and the Federal Reserve Board. Those were big, but they were very, very different than what they came to be after the 1970s. The FTC did not even have rulemaking power. It was simply an adjudicative body. It was kind of an Article II court of some sort. The Federal Reserve Board, it, but it acquired much more power after 1970. The Federal Reserve Board had enormous discretion in monetary policy, but did not have the regulatory, the immense regulatory authorities that it has acquired in recent years. The New Deal invented, or, or uh, it proliferated the idea of the regulatory commission, but these commissions were inbred and clubby. Uh, they were devoted to very narrow questions of adjudication and licensing. A big case before uh, the ICC might be whether a second trucker could haul artichokes from Castroville, California to Reno, Nevada. Informal rulemaking, which came later, had not even, you can't even, there's no case law on it. It wasn't even used before 1970. Uh, it enabled agencies to make policies with values of tens or hundreds of millions of dollars per year simply by canvassing for comments and announcing uh, what they wanted to do. As late as the 1970s, the doctrine of non-delegation was still alive. Uh, the idea of Chevron deference and other forms of judicial self-deference to what the administrative agencies want to do, these things were, were still in the future. In 1971, progressive Supreme Court Justice William O. Douglas invoked the Schechter Poultry case uh, from the New Deal, which, uh, which uh, prohibited a delegation of certain authorities to the bureaucracy. He invoked it positively to substitute his own view of what the, uh, a statute should mean for that the two agencies wanted to uh, use and forced the agencies uh, to do that in order for their work to be constitutional. The demise of these doctrines, non-delegation, uh, judicial uh, fidelity to the statutes in confining the agencies to what they wanted to do, they all uh, fell in the 1980s. Uh, the result of immensely complicated new forms of social regulation uh, where the courts were presented with impenetrable controversies under statu statutes that had passed Congress by vast majorities that were highly popular, that were devoted to issues that many, many people uh, cared about. We're holding that the uh, holding that the statutes were unconstitutional would have been far more disruptive and politically risky to the institution than anything in the 1930s. I'm sorry. I, I, I think I have a few okay. Okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to keep. We'll, we'll, we'll go to a committee. Okay. <clears throat> so I have, a, I have a somewhat different view of our current uh, fix. Uh, I am less uh, confident that a revival of popular appreciation of our constitutional heritage will suffice, and I'm more willing to settle for incremental uh, improvements. Uh, I, I think that the, uh, if we surveyed popular opinion, we would find that 90 percent of the American public thinks that the federal government should police the introduction of new chemical entities. If they are told that fidelity to the Constitution means that we have to have no policing of that, or that the decision on whether a new drug comes to market should be made by Congress or state legislators, I do not think that the cause of constitutional revival would be uh, advanced. I would love to abolish the Education Department, but I am a great fan of Secretary DeVos, uh, who uh, Paul has mentioned, 
uh, taking on particular improvements, such as unwinding these terrible excesses of the Office for Civil Rights, uh, championing at the national level school choice and uh, charter schools. I would like to amend the um, Administrative Procedure Act uh, to make the cost-benefit test uh, uh, statutory and reviewable. I'd like to see a 15-year sunset for every rule issued by the executive branch. I would like any citizen who has a gripe against the administrative state to be able to go directly to an Art Article III court uh, and have uh, his or her complaint adjudicated. The strict adherent to the original Constitution will fear that rationalizing the administrative state in these ways risks strengthening the administrative state uh, by making it uh, more productive uh, and more uh, popular. Uh, I don't think that Paul would go all the way, uh, but in talking about certain episodes of regulatory reform, there's a little bit of intimation uh, that incremental reforms can actually hurt the larger causes. I'm willing to take my chances. Uh, politics is endlessly contingent uh, and uh, unpredictable. Ways lead on to ways, uh, and not always or necessarily to new, uh, to new bad ways. The material developments that I have uh, summarized have in private markets led to Americans to be extremely picky customers and have produced huge improvements uh, in products and uh, services over the past 20 or 30 years. The gap between what we expect and, and get in private markets and in private society uh, with the inevitably uh, mediocre uh, products of uh, government is growing larger and uh, larger. Uh, the sheer uh, quantity and busybodiness and poor results of, of uh, government uh, bureaucracies, uh, it seems to me, uh, provides uh, many openings for uh, political action uh, in uh, this new world uh, that, uh, that I have uh, described. The Democratic Party, as Professor Marino says, uh, has become it's the progress, it has become progressive in the sense of the champion of essentially everything the bureaucratic state wants to do. Maybe a good business model for a time. I think it's very, very risky. The Republicans so far have not been highly effective opponents simply because they are subject to the same uh, immense political pressures to go along with uh, many uh, modern uh, in enthusiasms. But I think that increasingly there are large opportunities uh, uh, to be taken advantage of by uh, inspired political uh, leadership to go much further than we have uh, so far to reforming the bureaucratic state. Thank you. Paul Moreno has written a wide-ranging, well-researched, original book on the rise of the modern bureaucratic government. It's a comprehensive analysis that incorporates historical, political, economic, and legal scholarship as essential to making his case. The result is the bureaucrat kings, the origins and underpinnings of America's bureaucratic state. In it, Moreno lays out his indictment of the American administrative state and the new ruling class that has become its chief beneficiary. He writes as a historian, but his most interesting observations are derived from his views as a citizen. Unlike most social scientists, he does not accept the historical inevitability of what has been called social progress, nor does he recognize change or social reform as an unqualified good. He is aware of the profound effect that political change in light, he is, he consequently, he judges political and historic, uh, historical and political change in light of an unchanging standard of the public good or justice. He sees that standard or the common good as having been established in the ideas and the moral perspective inherent in the founding documents of the regime, the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. He laments, therefore, that, and I quote from him, the United States is ruled by an establishment nowhere mentioned in the U.S. Constitution. 
Once a federal republic, we have become a centralized bureaucracy run by an unelected administrative class. This class has consolidated power in Washington, D.C., and combines the legislative, executive, and judicial functions that the Constitution separated." End quote. He points to Congress as the principal culprit in justifying the new state. He notes, again, the Congress has delegated its lawmaking power to this bureaucracy, and in doing so, makes Congress more powerful and less accountable. Moreover, he knows that it has undermined the political conditions essential to the maintenance of popular rule, the political separation of powers and federalism. Consequently, Moreno does not spare the presidency, the courts, or the states as accomplices in the transformation of a constitutional regime into a bureaucratic state. In addition, he denies the claims of those who purport to have discovered a hidden or forgotten administrative constitution extending throughout American history, as some administrative law professors now claim. <laughs> of course, no realistic observer would deny the importance of administration in all government of any kind. Every activity of government requires some form of execution. And, educate, and agents with discretion of some kind to carry out those activities. The necessity of a competent administration as essential for good government was well known to the American founders. Its problematic character in terms of constitutional government derives from the fact, as Alexander Hamilton observed in Federalist Number 72, that, and I quote, the administration of government in its largest sense comprehends all of the operations of the body politic, whether legislative, executive, or judiciary, end quote. The political success of the Constitution depended upon separating those powers to prevent unified and despotic rule to, and to establish a limited government compatible with political consent and popular rule. Consequently, administration was understood as ministerial and subject to the authority of each of the political branches, all of which require administration of some kind. Consequently, administration understood as a practical activity has no independent or autonomous authority granted to it by the Constitution. The political branches participate in establishing the ground of administrating authority and controlling its effect as well. It is only within the modern concept of the rational state that administration acquires a new kind of technical, rational authority derived from universal or scientific knowledge, which establishes both its, its autonomy and assures its status. In this regard, I would go further than Moreno does in distinguishing modern bureaucracy from the older view of administration, understood as Hamilton did, in terms of prudence. Modern bureaucracy is meant to be a new form of rule, one that establishes the authority of organized knowledge and intelligence as the heart and mind of rational administration. Max Weber, perhaps the most profound student of bureaucracy, argued that, and I quote, the fate of our times is characterized by rationalization and intellectualization, and above all, the disenchantment of the world, end quote. In his view, the shift from traditional authority to legal, rational authority would lead to, and I quote again, polar night of icy darkness that would, that would culminate in an iron cage of rational control. For Weber, end quote, for Weber, modern bureaucracy is the final form of the metamorphosis of reason and its last and only value. He noted, and I quote again, joined to the dead machine, bureaucratic organization is at work to erect the shell of that future bondage to which one day men will perhaps be forced to submit in impotence. As once the phalas in the ancient Egyptian state, if purely technical good, that is rational bureaucratic administration and maintenance is the last and only value which is desired to decide on the manner in which their affairs are direct, end quote. And in his despair, he wondered, what have we to set against this machinery in order to preserve a remnant of humanity 
from this parceling out of the soul, from this, from the, this exclusive rule of bureaucratic life it ideals, end quote. I do not mean to suggest that Moreno is sympathetic to bureaucratic rule. On the contrary, by re revealing the theoretical and political roots of the Founders' Constitution, he shows them to be wholly incompatible with what has come to be understood as bureaucratic or rational rule. In America's founding period and throughout its first century and beyond, Moreno shows that administration was understood in terms of limited government constitutionalism and federalism or decentralized administration. Popular government required that the rule of law must, must be established by the people's representatives and legitimized by the consent of the government. In developing his argument, Moreno gives a brief but masterful account of the relentless growth of the administrative state throughout the 20th century. The bulk of the book deals with the four waves of the administrative state that paralleled the political uh, transformation that occurred in the 20th century. The fourth wave has revealed the inability of the political branches and political parties to impose limits on administrative rule. Moreno recognizes that although the separation of power, and I quote from him, was designed to prevent the rise of a centralized bureaucratic state, once that state was established, the same structure made it difficult to undo. However, Moreno denies that the transformation of the regime was a product of social and economic change. Rather, he argues that that, that the change of administrative rule was not inevitable or merely the result of technological change. Although he does not deny the reality of social and economic change, he implies that political choice depends upon political theory. It was, Moreno suggests, and I quote, the late 19th century progressives who chose not to return to our founding principle, but adopt modern continental European theories of government. Moreno insists that the political thought of the American founding presupposes the possibility and even the necessity of a return to first principles. He turns to Lincoln as the guide in making choices necessitated by political and social change. He notes, and I quote again, socioeconomic reality changed between the American Revolution and the Civil War. But Lincoln and the Republicans persuaded the American people to return to the principles of founding. However, by the end of the 19th century, the influence of German thought had made the possibility of such a return more difficult. As a result, it was thought that although change required political choice, it was impossible to reject change once history had come to be understood in terms of rational necessity. Then rational choice required adaptation or accommodation of the new and limits choice to the rejection of a reactionary past. Such historicist thought inspired the programmatic agenda for the politics of progressivism and 20th century liberalism. The growth of the bureaucratic state parallels the rise of the new social sciences and the positivist understanding of the law. The authority which justified and legitimized the modern administrative state is the technical rational knowledge derived from the methodology of the new social sciences. Moreno's judgment concerning the absence of bureaucratic rule throughout much of America's past was corroborated by two of the most prominent observers of democracy and bureaucracy of the last two centuries. In the 19th century, Tocqueville described the phenomenon of democratic despotism even more before the bureaucracy had revealed itself. He called it centralized administration. And he warned democracies must avoid it if they are to remain free. He praised America for its defense of civil society institutions and private associations and the absence of centralized administrative rule. Nearly a century later, Ludwig von Mises still confirmed Tocqueville's judgment concerning America. In his book, Bureaucracy, published just before the end of the Second World War, von Mises insisted that only America 
could still resist bureaucratic rule. He noted, and I quote, although the evolution of bureaucratism has been very rapid in these last years, America is still, compared with the rest of the world, only superficially afflicted. It shows only a few of the characteristic features of bureaucratic management. America alone is still free to choose, and the decision of the American people will determine the outcome of the whole of mankind." End quote. At mid-century, 20th century, Mises, von Mises still believed that America was governed politically by those who held offices of limited power under the authority of a written constitution. He did not think that America was bureaucratically ruled because it was not yet ruled by those whose title to rule was expert knowledge. As he noted, and I quote again, if citizens are under the intellectual hegemony of bureaucratic professionals, society breaks up into two castes, the ruling professionals, the Brahmins, and the gullible citizenry. Then despotism emerges, whatever the wording of the Constitution and laws may be. Like Tocqueville, he believed that bureaucratic rule was a form of democratic des despotism. And like Tocqueville, he believed that America still had a choice, one that made determine the fate of the whole of mankind. It was the abandonment of the American founders' theoretical perspective of justice or natural right and a rejection of its embodiment in the political science of the Constitution that made bureaucratic rule possible. The theoretical defense of rational limits imposed by nature or nature's God as a condition of human happiness was to become almost indistinguishable from a political defense of the founders' principles. That view required limited government as a necessary condition of the defense of liberty. The administrative state requires unlimited power or rational control of every human problem. However, the long-term success of administrative rule would require delegitimizing the, principle of the, found, the principles of the founding in the eyes of the people. It would require establishing the legitimacy of the administrative state. As Moreno notes, even the defenders of the administrative state still admit that state lacks legitimacy. The American people have not consented to it." End quote. Nonetheless, as Moreno has shown, the politics of progressivism has succeeded in empowering a new class, the bureaucratic kings, the bureaucratic king, drawn from both the public and private sector, whose interest requires the perpetuation of an administrative state directed from the center. Consequently, the defense of justice or the common good understood in terms of principles that established constitutional government still demanded the defense of political rule as opposed to rational rule. Democracy means self-determination, von Mises noted. How can people determine their own affairs if they are too indifferent to gain through their own thinking and an independent judgment on fundamental political and economic problems? Democracy is not a good that people can enjoy without trouble. It is, on the contrary, a treasure that must be daily defended and conquered anew by strenuous effort." End quote. Tocqueville and von Mises described an America still animated by its tradition of constitutionalism and its defense of human freedom. In failing to, in failing to comprehend its animating principles or by denying the justice of its own past, it is, is it destined to, be, to, to succumb to the fate described by Max Weber? The verdict in America is not yet in, but as long as the people are free to choose their political leaders and are capable of not merely participating in elections, but are thereby enabled to transform the political institutions, the rule of the few, however well organized and however good its intentions, remains precarious. It may be the case that it's still easier to enjoy the benefits of rational rule than to take the trouble of reestablishing political rule. If so, perhaps as Alexander Solzhenitsyn once noted, only the piteous crowbar of events can bring about the kind of crisis that might reawaken the desire for freedom and self-government. Thank you.
Thank you for that wonderful panel. We have time for some questions. I think we're going to go directly to that. Uh, there are microphones here in the room, and if you would uh, raise a hand, I'm sure our panel will be happy to grapple with your hard questions. Thank you. Several of you talked about the, the, the fact that our legislators pass very vague laws and then expect the regulators to flesh them out and actually run the country. Is that intentional? How long, if so, has, how long has it been intentional? Uh, and if so, why? I mean, why don't the regulators, excuse me, the legislators pass laws that don't require so much interpretation? Yeah, I, I would say it's, um, it's, it's nothing new. And the important thing about it is, is that when legislators do that, uh, they do it in a way, it, it looks like they're giving away power. And, you know, Madison in the Federalist Papers says that the Constitution is based on the idea that the legislature in a Republican government is apt to absorb all the powers into its impetuous vortex. And so the founders didn't think the problem was the legislature giving away, problem, giving away power. They thought it was aggrandizing power. So this looks like they're acting in, in a you know, self-abnegating way, but they're not, right? Because they're saying making the hard policy choices, right? It, that's difficult. Uh, lawmaking is hard and it's politically risky. So let these guys do it. And then when they make the rules in such a way that it harms my constituents, then I intervene uh, as a sort of a, an ombudsman, ombud, And that is going to help my chances to get reelected. So I think that's the way that the new system works. It's actually Congress increasing its power by letting somebody else make these hard choices. I think the first of these was the Interstate Commerce Act. Uh, where if you look at the railroad industry uh, in the late 19th century, you had sort of conflicting uh, policy uh, uh, constraints. Uh, railroads had monopoly powers in some lines, and there was too much competition in others, and you, you couldn't get any reconciliation of the conflicting interests. So the Interstate Commerce Commission was the first of these independent regulatory agencies that was given the power to you know, make those choices. Uh, it took a long time, though, because the courts at the time kept the first, this first agency on a very short leash because they looked upon them as competitors. And a lot of what the progressives were trying to do was establish a, uh, these regulatory agencies as alternatives to the regular courts. And the way in which the courts manage that is a very interesting part of the story. I think uh, Chris is right about the, bureau uh, the bureaucratic state as we know it really didn't, didn't arise in a, a fundamental way until the, the 70s. And what, I think what changed was so much of, of political activity was conducted at state and local government levels before the 1960s and 70s. And that meant that there was a decentralized kind of administrative structure. And Congress itself defended state autonomy until about 1965 until it then began to think that the only way that we, they can compete with the executive is to, is, is to centralize administrative power. But when you make laws on great detailed things, you can't make general laws. You have to delegate that power to specialized bodies. You're try, in other words, in trying to do so much that used to be done either at state and local govern, uh, level of government or in civil society institutions. Remember, you had a whole private sector that, that is increasingly being changed in this period. And so it becomes impossible to, uh, uh, to pass general laws uh, in that way. And uh, I think uh, Paul is right that, that then, too, that once they learn how to delegate authority and profit from it by, by establishing uh, ways in which they could remain in their offices by nonpartisan, nonpolitical activity, ombudsman-like activity, etc. It, it becomes much harder. I, I agree with what Paul and John have said. I would, uh, I would add two points. Uh, one is that uh, passing very, very generally worded statutes that essentially establish as law, just kind of good things that we all agree for, uh, agree with, and then leaving the discretion to the agencies uh, <clears throat> was, was in order to deal with this vast quantity of pressures for doing things. 
So, oh, the federal government's in charge of hiring and firing handicapped people. I, it never occurred to me that the federal government should do that. But you know, now that people come in and talk to me, yes, you know, we should be in favor of, of that. But there are a lot of complicated questions there. We don't have time for it. So we're just going to set up an agency and let them handle it. Next. So, I mean, you can, you can make a lot of law that way. Uh, secondly, there was, a, there was another pro-growth part to this. Uh, the old New Deal agencies, uh, uh, they were kind of balancing. They weren't missionary agencies. Uh, they were just, they were mainly cartels, actually. The new agencies were missionary. And I do believe that there was a strong uh, pro-government, pro-growth, uh, progressive in the modern sense of the term, uh, animus uh, behind passing vague statutes. Because what they were doing is they were taking a, a general proposition that everybody would agree with, but they were setting up a missionary agency devoted to it. And they knew that that would lead to a much more activist, interventionist government than they would be able to get through a vote of uh, majorities of the House and the Senate. So I, so I think that, that there were these other um, uh, factors operating as well. My name is Bruce Hamilton. I'm from Dallas. A question for Mr. DeMuth. Um, I appreciate your thesis, as I understand it, that technology, specifically uh, communications and transportation, have driven opportunities for more and more narrow factions, which drove the centralization of power. Um, the thing that I, you didn't address was structural changes, and I'm specifically thinking about the 16th and 17th Amendments, which allowed the popular election of senators and the federal income tax, which drove the, or averted the gaze of the average citizen away from the State House and to Washington. I'd like to have your opinion on those kinds of structural uh, changes. Well, uh, I, 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 I think they've been important. Um, and uh, the nationalization of, of political organization and discourse uh, goes back uh, goes back a long way and we and I think that these antecedents are important uh, my what I would say about uh, the impact of uh, technology on this is that it has made Madison's extended Republic small so when we talk about problems we uh, we can all connect with each other we can put together uh, coalitions that are for uh, this and that uh, that we have set in place earlier in the 20th century institutions like uh, a national unapportioned uh, tax, uh, a popular election of uh, senators, <coughs> has, uh, has sort of set the table uh, for uh, a huge nationalization of political uh, discourse. Uh, but I think that other de material developments uh, since then have enabled these ideas that were there before uh, to uh, achieve things in governmental growth, uh, uh, suppression of uh, the initiative and sovereignty of states uh, and, uh, and other unhappy developments. I have right, this one right here in the middle. Sorry. <laughs> in the opinion of the panel, are there other countries that do it better, at least to a limited extent? Are there lessons we can draw from abroad? Uh, I'd say, you know, if you look at healthcare, there'd be some better examples of that. The United States spends something like you know, close to 20% of our GDP on, on healthcare because of the you know, clumsy sort of incremental ways in which our system of employer financed healthcare has, has arisen. And a lot of people, again, even conservatives and sort of libertarians would say, we'd be better off if we had a single payer system because it, it would just be more efficient than all of the bureaucratic waste that's, that's built into this. So the kind of accidental, incremental way in which our welfare state has developed, I think, has made other countries, yeah, do it, do it better. Um, I, th I think that the, the decline of the representative legislature and the assumption of many, many governing powers that did not belong to the executive since uh, uh, before, the, before the U.S. Constitution is a universal phenomenon. And I think I could give 
we can give approximately the same talks about developments in the European Union uh, and so forth. I, I think that uh, I think that other states have a better uh, have a better mix um, in um, in in Denmark. Uh, they have a very generous uh, safety net, uh, but uh, the employment relationship is much more governed by private contract. Uh, people have it's, it is a less regulated uh, uh, nation. It's a nation of six million people. It's highly homogeneous, and it's, I think it's very difficult to draw lessons from such a society for for a vast, uh, highly heterogeneous extended nation such as ours. Yeah, I, I think it depends what you want rule to be, whether you want people to participate in their own rule or whether you want rational rule. I mean, Brussels, in the European Union, you have ra a relatively expert rational rule, but now you see the dissatisfaction of the people in those countries because they don't have political participation in, in that kind of rule. So I think it, it's a question of with, whether or not you want human freedom, where, where human individuals are free to pursue the kinds of activities that they can pursue in other ways other than political and governmental. That would require reestablishing some kind of ground for a civil society that I think is, has disappeared. You have a, a kind of politicization of everything. Of, of course, technology makes it much simpler but it also makes it harder to establish any kind of common good, any kind of, uh, any notion of a, of a particular fate of a particular people. And so even the notion of a country becomes uh, uh, difficult to sustain in, in, in our time. It's a radical, uh, Trump's r uh, running uh, to try to establish uh, a concept of American citizenship where the common good is the country itself. That's like the last common good among America. If you, that should be the first common good <laughs> in a normal social compact situation, but it's a question of what you want. I, I, I made the choice between, you get either rational rule or political rule. Maybe we want rational rule, in which case then you don't have political rule. I think with that, we're going to have to stay on our schedule and conclude this panel, and we are going to move into lunch, which is directly in the hallway or the ballroom around through the hallway. Thank you very much. Thank you to the panelists.